thanks for coming uh, to my defense. Where's my clicker? Um, so I'm actually really excited um, to share um, the work that I've been doing for the last two years. Um, I'm almost done. Um, and we're going to start with this photo here. So um, this is my favorite photo from the field area um, because it sort of mimics my study. Um, so this photo is actually taken in the Arc in the Sierra Nevada um, in the Stokes Mountain region, uh, which is in the Western Arc. Um, and this is not the topography that most people think of when they uh, start to think of the Sierra Nevada. Uh, most people think of the High Sierra, which is in the east. Um, but much like this photo, my study is going to start in the Western Arc, and then we are going to move over um, into these uh, snowy, high-peaked mountains of, of the Eastern Sierra. So you can go ahead and read the roadmap of my talk, but I'm going to just take a second to show you um, some photos of the rocks that I used in my study, um, because as Diane said, they are the real stars um, here. Move them out, sorry. Um, so um, let's see, like Diane, she kind of stole my thunder. <laughs> um, so like Diane said, I'm going to be talking to you um, about a relatively new and, and innovative technique um, that's been used in the past um, to study um, some granitoids, um, especially even granitoids from the Sierra. Um, but this is the first study that I know of, that I hope is the first study, um, to target zircon from Gabros um, for this paired isotopic analysis. Um, so all of us are familiar with the Sierra Nevada in one way or another. It's really close to our backyard. Most of us are uh, familiar with it in the terms of awesome fishing and camping. Um, but it turns out the Sierra is actually the most comprehensively studied continental margin arc in the entire world. Um, so the emplacement of the Sierra Nevada um, spans pretty much the entire Mesozoic, kind of like it was planned. Um, and uh, it actually accounts for a large portion of what is known as the Mesozoic Crustal Growth Event. Um, continental margin arcs are specifically important to petrologists because they um, provide this great natural laboratory in which we can study um, the development of new continental crust, the transfer of material from the mantle um, to the crust. So really quick. To bring everybody up to speed, hopefully everyone is familiar with this traditional sort of cartoon schematic of a subduction zone, right? So in the Sierra Nevada, the Farallon plate is subducting, fluids are released into the mantle, it melts, magma ascends, voila, we have a volcanic arc, right? Uh, we're going to focus on the area in this blue box um, more specifically. This diagram is a configuration that is probably more realistic um, in representation um, of the geometry of the Sierra Nevada Arc. Um, so what you'll notice is that the crust in what would become the Eastern Sierra is much thicker than the crust that was present in the West. And you'll also notice that the composition of the crust um, is incredibly diverse. It's complicated by both tectonics um, and various different lithologies. Um, what's fairly special about the Sierra Nevada are these well-documented arc traversing trends um, throughout the batholith. Um, it's considered a zoned, a zoned I want to say pluton, but batholith is much larger than that. Um, and traditionally, these uh, arc traversing trends are attributed um, to be the result of this thickened crust in the east and to this um, complicated uh, sort of crustal hodgepodge um, of rocks. Um, we can even see some of the, this isotopic variation, or we can see the variation in these isotopes um, with uh, respect to some of these tectonic complications. Um, so if we look at these figures, uh, this is sort of a map view. My field area is here in the yellow. Um, and if we look at uh, A to A prime, uh, which is here before emplacement of the arc, we see that complicated crust, and we see the tectonic elements. Uh, and it's proposed that these tectonic elements also extend down into the mantle. Um, after the emplacement, right, so it's a lot of this complication is sort of obliterated. Um, but it's been proposed that, the, that heterogeneities in the mantle may be responsible for some of these arc traversing trends that we see within the pluton. And the composition of the mantle in the Sierra Nevada is important uh, to petrologists because uh, we need to use it to um, estimate the quantities of mantle and the quantities of crust that were used in making the rocks that are present in the Sierra Nevada today. 
um, which will tell us how much juvenile crust was actually formed during that Mesozoic crustal growth event in the Sierra Nevada. So I'm going to talk a little bit about mantle compositions. Um, so I need to define for you what depleted mantle is. Um, depleted mantle um, is the residual mantle that's left after repeated extractions of basaltic melt during partial melting. Um, so a good example of this is the extraction of mid-ocean ridge basalt um, at mid-ocean ridges, right? Um, and so the mantle that's left over is uh, depleted in large ion lithophiles. It's got a very predictable and consistent isotopic um, composition. Um, and this consistency led to um, the definition and the term depleted mantle, referring to mantle of this composition. Right? OK. Yeah? OK. Um, <laughs> um, there's a problem, however, with, with other mantle compositions. Um, Anything that does not have a depleted mantle composition is referred to as enriched mantle. So it's very difficult to pinpoint enriched mantle because it doesn't have a defined composition. There are a few like kinds of enriched mantle that are defined, but it certainly doesn't span all of the compositions possible. So um, within the Sierra Nevada, um, it is fairly well accepted by the scientific community that the magmas in the eastern, sorry, in the western Sierra um, are derived from a depleted mantle source. Um, so some of these studies just in the southern part that fits on my map um, include the Guadalupe intrusive complex, the fine gold intrusive complex, um, and previous studies in the Stokes Mountain region. Um, however, alternatively, there have been numerous studies um, spanning the last, I don't know, 20, almost 30 years, I suppose, um, that have suggested that ma uh, some magmas in the east are instead potentially uh, derived from an enriched mantle province. Um, the debate, however, about the presence of this enriched mantle um, is ongoing. Um, most of these studies are based in whole rock analyses, um, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment, um, and most of them are based in granitic rocks. Um, so uh, there, there is an inherent problem at getting at the composition of the mantle. Um, it's really difficult to sample, imagine that, right? We can't go to the mantle. Um, there aren't really any mantle xenoliths in plutonic rocks. Um, there are mantle xenoliths. Um, one study uses them here at the Big Pine Volcanic Field. Um, but they're much younger. They're from the Cenozoic. Um, and there's uh, some hypotheses that um, suggest that the composition of the Cenozoic mantle and the Mesozoic mantle are not uh, the same. And so it's not a good um, analogy for the Mesozoic mantle. Um, and so we get to sample by proxy. And the proxy of petrologists um, is, isotop is isotopes. Um, and specifically, the major rebuttals um, that uh, refute, that's not a good sentence, um, the presence of this enriched mantle region cite the lack of isotopic studies um, in mafic rocks. So mafic rocks are really specifically important to studies that are targeting the composition of the mantle because um, mafic rocks have undergone minimal geochemical differentiation. Um, and so they more accurately represent the composition of the mantle that was um, extracted from, or the magma that was extracted from the mantle, whereas granitoids have inherently been uh, evolved, right? This is a problem in the Sierra Nevada because only 5% of the Sierra Nevada surface area is mafic, right? So it's incredibly difficult to conduct these studies here. So in my study, um, I'm going to be focusing on two locations um, that are uh, that are special um, to the special for this reason um, because they have abundances of mafic rocks. The whoops, the first of which is the Stokes Mountain region, which is here. You see the arrow, boom, right here. It's in the western uh, Sierra Nevada, uh, the western Batholith. So Stokes Mountain is in the west. Um, and then we're going to be looking at the Kern Plateau, which is in the eastern batholith. Um, I'm going to use gabbros from these two locations, and I'm going to use this technique that Diane was talking about um, to see if it is a good um, to see if this is a good analysis to target the mantle component of these magmas. Okay, a little bit about each field area. Um, so, like I said earlier, uh, multiple lines of evidence, uh, isotopic lines of evidence, including some mafic rocks um, from the Stokes Mountain region have confirmed that it's derived from a depleted mantle source. Um, these are just a few of like the, the end values of the isotopic database. 
um, that is based in the Stokes Mountain region. Um, and these rocks have uranium lead ages that span from 124 million years to 115 million years old. Um, this is actually the most mafic representation of the early Cretaceous arc, so this is a fairly unique field area, and I really enjoyed working here. Um, and then we're going to compare values from the Stokes Mountain to rocks of the Kern Plateau. Um, so the Kern Plateau is located approximately 100 kilometers east-southeast on the other side of the Sierra Crest. Um, minimal previous work has been done here, which is great because we can keep working there. Um, and uh, we decided that this area is good to compare with the Stokes Mountain region because the rocks are relatively the same age. At least they're mapped that way. Um, they're approximately along the same uh, line of latitude, which is 36 degrees north. Um, and the Kern Plateau is in geographic line with those other provinces of uh, proposed enriched mantle um, sources. So essentially, my study tests two hypotheses. First, um, I intend to uh, I intended uh, to test the hypothesis that um, the paired analysis of delta O18 and uh, epsilon hafnium in zircon from Gabros is a good way to target the mantle composition of magmas. Um, and then my second hypothesis is that I can use this technique um, to determine if heterogeneity existed in the mantle below the Mesozoic Sierra Nevada and determine whether that enriched uh, region existed. So essentially, like, don't worry about what it says, essentially my study works like this. We used the Stokes Mountain region because it's well uh, described and we have a lot of information about it. It's known to come from depleted mantle. So it's essentially our control group, right? So we try this new technique there, see if we can uh, replicate the, um, the depleted mantle signature that's traditionally gotten through whole rock. Um, and if it works, then we can apply the same technique in the east. Yeah? Beautiful. Okay. Um, so my study has a few strengths that the other studies are lacking. Um, I think the greatest strength of my study is that I'm focusing on zircon. Um, so zircon is the uh, mineral separate uh, of choice for most geochemists. Um, for it fractionates very early in the um, fractionation sequence and at high temperatures, um, so it's present for most of the life of the magma. Um, but then it records the composition of its host melt and then it resists chemical and mechanical um, alteration, accurately preserving the composition of that parental uh, host uh, magma so that we can analyze it later today. Um, whole rock analyses, on the other hand, uh, your values might reflect some sort of secondary alteration, and they're less than ideal for uh, a number of reasons. Um, and secondly, the strength of the study is that I'm focusing on mafic rocks, right? And I've already, we've already iterated. Mafic rocks are important because they're good proxies of the composition of the mantle. Okay, uh, really quickly, I'm going to give you a crash course in my analytical methods. Um, a huge challenge facing the study, as Diane talked about earlier, was separating zircon from gabbros. So zircon are present in um, gran granitic rocks and more silicic rocks um, nearly ubiquitously, um, but they are unpredictably uh, present in gabbro. Um, and so we decided that we need to, to sample the gabbro um, with criteria in mind intended to increase the probability that we'd get enough zircon for analysis. Um, and that's the key, is enough zircon for analysis. If I got one or two, we were still up a creek. Um, so we use the very simple logic that if our crystals had enough time to grow, that our zircon would also have enough time to grow. So we sampled rocks that were very coarse and coarse grained in texture. Um, and we were also looking for rocks that were homo uh, homogenous in terms of texture to avoid um, sampling mixed magmas. Um, and then we just decided that we should uh, combat the low uh, probability of zircon with sheer volume. And uh, each of my samples was approximately 60 pounds, or um, an entire full um, five-gallon bucket, most of which the entire thing got uh, processed for each of my samples. In total, I collected 13 gabbros, um, and I got analyzable aliquots of zircon out of seven, uh, which I considered a great success. It was very exciting. Um, so we sampled in the Stokes Mountain region. Um, if this were a different talk, I'd be telling you about the awesome geology in the Stokes Mountain region. Um, and really all you need to know is that my samples reflect lithologic and geographic diversity. Um, I have a larger image of the map here. Um, and so that's really what you're supposed to take from uh, 
my sample locations. Um, the other reason that we chose these samples are, um, well, the GABRAs are shown here in blue, the little blue dots and their numbers, um, but they're chosen in geographic proximity uh, to previously sampled granitoids that I sort of commandeered into uh, my research project. Um, and so we can make these analyses as well. Um, we sampled in the Kern Plateau using exactly the same logic as we did in the, Sierra, or in the Stokes Mountain region. Um, this is a, the simplified geologic map of the area. These are the two itty bitty bodies of uh, the Summit Gabbro, is the name of the unit that we sampled. They're approximately six miles uh, apart from each other as the bird flies. Uh, they're much farther if you are walking with 20 pounds of rock in your backpack, I promise. Um, so my analytical methods. Um, the very first and uh, I guess the simplest analytical method that we uh, used was whole rock geochemistry. Uh, so we analyzed bulk powders via x-ray fluorescence. Uh, we did this at Pomona College. Um, and specifically we needed this analysis because we were interested in the silica weight percent and the magnesium number, which we calculated with this, calcu with this equation, um, because they're excellent gauges of the amount of differentiation that a magma has seen. Um, the first isotopic system um, that we analyzed, so you get a crash course in isotope geochemistry right now, um, is hafnium. So hafnium-176 um, is the radiogenic decay product of lutetium-176, um, forms via beta decay at a half-life of approximately 3.5 billion years. Um, and fractionation of hafnium ions uh, or of hafnium isotopes from lutetium um, occurs during partial melting of the mantle. So this happens because the lutetium preferentially wants to stay inside the residual mantle, whereas the hafnium ions are incompatible and so they go into the melt. So this repeated extraction um, of basaltic magma or the repeated partial melting of the mantle results in uh, in portions of the mantle that have unique epsilon hafnium fingerprints. Um, and that is the way that we use epsilon hafnium, not as a date, um, but as a fingerprint of the mantle source. Um, epsilon hafnium is always standardized to chondrite, um, and it's corrected with a uranium lead age from the exact same crystal um, to account for any sort of decay of lutetium that may have gotten accidentally stuck inside our zircon crystal. Another vir uh, virtue of using zircon um, in our analysis is that the hafnium ion replaces or substitutes for the zirconium ion in zircon uh, based on camouflage. So they've got the same um, charge and they've got the same radius. And so the hafnium is actually in the lattice of the zircon, which is great for us because it means it's relatively abundant. Um, and this also sort of explains why other isotopic studies have not tar uh, targeted zircon in the past. Right, so traditional isotopes that are used in this sense are strontium and neodymium, neither of which um, are found in zircon. So epsilon hafnium is measured um, with this really awesome instrument called a multi-collector laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer. Um, and we use this at the Arizona Laser Con Center um, at the University of Arizona. Um, so first what we do, we consult these color cathodoluminescence images of the zircon once they've been mounted and polished. Um, and we choose homogeneous parts of the zircon grain to place the laser ablation pits, right? So we want to avoid things like cracks and metamic textures so that we get good results. Um, and so you see my little spots here, the yellow circles that are on the inside, those are the uranium lead pits, the diameter of which is about 30 microns. Um, and then the pink spots that are directly over them are the hafnium, uh, the hafnium laser pits, and those are about 40 microns uh, in diameter. So first we analyze the uranium lead, and then we do the epsilon hafnium. The second isotopic uh, system that I use is oxygen, um, which varies widely from hafnium. They uh, don't have too much in common. Uh, first off, uh, delta O18 um, is a stable isotope. Um, and the fractionation of oxygen 18 from oxygen 16 happens during crystallization because uh, crystals will preferentially bond with oxygen 18 because it forms lower energy bonds and everything wants to be in a low energy state, right? Okay, um, delta 18 is uh, standardized to Vienna standard mean ocean water. That's VSMO in our calculation here. 
Um, this is a graphical representation of the terrestrial reservoirs of oxygen isotopes. Um, so seawater here, this is our standard, and so it plots at zero. So everything is relative to seawater. Um, this bar represents mantle zircon, uh, which have a fairly consistent value of 5.3 plus or minus 0.3 per mil. Um, and here highlighted in the Cielo box um, are uh, first is meteoric water, which, are rel which generally have negative values. Um, and then sediments, which make up the continental crust, which typically have very high values. Cherts are the highest. I think they get up to like plus 40 delta O18. Um, and the reason that we decided to use delta O18 is that it's an excellent, um, it's excellent at tracking the assimilation history of a magma. So for example, if we have, uh, um, uh, if we have a magma um, that we uh, originally thought to come out of the mantle, um, and then we analyze its delta O18 and we find that it's got a delta O18 of say 10, we can assume that it has assimilated some continental crust. And that continental crust has contributed its high delta O18 value to the magma. Right? Okay. So uh, delta O18 was uh, analyzed via secondary ion mass spectrometry, or SIMS. Um, and we used the large radius ion microprobe, which is at UCLA. Um, it's a really scary instrument to use. Um, essentially, all mass spectrometers work the same once your sample is in there. They fly through a flight tube and they wind up in cups that are specifically placed to collect certain masses. Um, but how you get your sample into the mass spectrometer varies um, from system to system. So previously, we used a laser in uh, laser ablation. It's a UV laser. Um, here, we're using a, pre a beam of primary cesium ions uh, that hit the surface of the zircon and sputters it, sort of roughs up the surface and sends uh, the atoms from the zircon into the mass spectrometer. And that's how this is analyzed. Um, these little blue dots here in the cathode luminescence images are the uh, SIMS lasers, or the SIMS uh, ion spots. Um, they're much smaller, which is great. We get really good spatial resolution. Um, the, really, the beauty of SIMS and of laser ablation is that within one single crystal, within the same zone of the same crystal, we can analyze uranium lead, epsilon, hafnium, and delta 18 of the same crystal. There's so much more to you could do, like trace elements. Oh man, I have big plans for this thing. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, what's really special, though, about the paired analysis of epsilon hafnium and of delta 18, um, not only is it relatively uh, new and the single grain analysis makes it powerful, but you're measuring different parameters of the zircon. So in hafnium, you're measuring um, uh, a ratio that is the function of decay and of time, and where in epsilon, no, in delta 18, you're measuring um, a ratio that's uh, based on temperature and mass fractionation. Okay, results, finally. Um, so geochronology is not the main focus of my study, um, but the uranium lead dates that we got from our zircon are significant, especially in the Stokes Mountain region, um, because they tell us uh, how well our samples fit in with previous databases. Um, so in this sample, or sorry, in this figure, um, are the uranium lead ages of previous studies within the Stokes Mountain region. And my gabbroic zircon uranium lead samples are shown here in yellow. And really all this sample or all this figure is supposed to convey is that these rocks fit within the previously determined magmatic regime, meaning that we can use the old isotopic database for comparison with this new study. Um, we also found that the summit, the summit gabbro is slightly older than we'd hoped, which is okay. Um, it's got ages of 148 and 151 million years. Um, so this is uh, my first slide with my, ox with my isotopic data. Um, this is a plot of SAO2 versus epsilon hafnium. Petrologists love plotting against silica. <laughs> um, uh, it's really a good way of telling how your system is changing with regard um, to your composition, to down temperature crystallization. Um, and so we explain what you're looking at here. Each bar, each bar of data, there are two here, they kind of fit on top of each other. There are also two here that fit on top of each other. Um, so each bar represents one rock, right? It has one silica value. And each spot represents the hafnium analysis of one individual zircon. Um, and so what we see is that there is uh, an immediate separation of the east and the west based in the epsilon hafnium values. Um, these rocks up here in this sort of higher vertical bar, our horizontal bar, are um, 
the western samples from the Stokes Mountain region. Uh, the blue are the granitoids and the red are the gabbros. And these two samples down here, the red triangles, are the summit gabbro from the eastern Kern Plateau. Um, consistently, we see that there is approximately a seven to nine epsilon unit uh, variation which in each sample, um, which alarmed us at first. Um, but it turns out other petrologists and geochemists see a similar spread and it's, it's not exactly understood yet uh, what that's from. So that's kind of cool. At least we're consistent. Um, this plot shows um, the Stokes Mountain data and the Summit Gabbro data. So the eastern here, oops, the eastern here and the western data here with respect to the depleted mantle evolution curve. So let me explain what that means. I know this inset is small, um, but it's okay. So the depleted mantle evolution curve is this black line. It's the same line here, only zoomed in for time. And essentially what this curve uh, represents is the maximum composition that maximum epsilon half medium composition of the depleted mantle at any given point in time. So time is down here on this half 176. So we start out with lower amounts of half medium in the beginning of time, and we wind up with more half medium now. Okay. Um, so what we see here is that the summit, sorry, the Stokes Mountain uh, samples from the Western Sierra, um, they plot very close to the depleted mantle evolution curve. Um, four rocks of this age, the maximum epsilon half medium values are between 16 and 18 units. Um, and so this is excellent for us because our maximum value is 15.9, um, which is exciting for us. This is the highest epsilon half medium value that's been recorded to date in the Sierra Nevada. So not that that means anything, but I don't know, it's exciting to me. Um, um, I forgot what I was going to say. Yeah, okay. Um, so just based on this plot, we can um, start to make some cursory interpretations, right? Um, the first thing that we can uh, tell ourselves is that because these values are so close to the depleted mantle, this is good evidence for us that this, the western rocks, uh, those from this, the, the Stokes Mountain region, are derived from a depleted mantle. Um, and it's possible um, that maybe the spread in those values uh, reflects some sort of assimilation um, trend. Unfortunately, though, this is sort of the extent of the interpretations we can make with the epsilon half medium values alone. Um, and this is because the epsilon half medium data is non unique. And what I mean by that um, is that there are multiple uh, scenarios in which we can result, in which can result in, uh, in the same values. So, my example of this um, are these negative values down here of the magmas in the eastern Sierra. Um, so here's just a few, this, a list of possible explanations. Uh, number one, um, maybe those negative values uh, reflect um, ascension and assimilation of that thick crust that's in the eastern um, Sierra. Um, it's possible that this is uh, a representation of assimilation of a body that's been under thrust um, into uh, the magma source region of the eastern Sierra. That's a hypothesis that's been proposed um, in the past. Or it could mean um, that it's from a different composition of mantle, um, an enriched mantle source that has a negative epsilon half medium value. Um, and so the way that we sort of figure out, the way we sort of suss out the ambiguity of the epsilon half medium values in the east is with our oxygen isotopic data. Um, so this is a plot of all of the study samples of the gabbros and the granites in delta O18 epsilon half medium space. Um, and I have inserted for your uh, interpretation ease, um, the purple bar and the blue bar represent uh, mantle zircon values um, at one and two sigma respectively. Um, and then the dotted box represents uh, mid-ocean ridge basalt, the isotopic composition of mid-ocean ridge basalt as sort of a whole rock um, analogy as well. Um, okay, so let's start to make some interpretations. Um, so these are two of the samples, um, two, only two samples uh, of the both gabbros um, from my study. Um, but I want to point out um, a trend that we see that's very common. Um, so we call this an assimilation fractionation crystal, uh, assimilation fractional crystallization trend, or, or AFC for short, because nobody wants to say that all the time. Um, and essentially what that means is that as you start here uh, with a depleted mantle um, or a more 
a, a less differentiated magma composition. Um, as assimilation occurs, your epsilon half mean value drops, and as assimilation of continental crust occurs, your um, delta O18 values increase. Um, and so you see a really nice trend uh, toward the values of continental crust, and we call this an AFC trend, right? Alternatively, uh, this sample down here is more of a shotgun pattern, right? And there's no trend here. Um, so this is not something that we would interpret as having influence uh, of continental crust. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so this is the data um, of the samples from the West. The gabbros are shown in um, enclosed symbols and the granitoids are shown in open symbols. Um, what we see here is a really gorgeous AFC trend, right? So we start out with relatively depleted mantle values, um, and then we see higher values in delta 18 and lower values in uh, epsilon hafnium, which is what we would expect from the assimilation of continental crust. This is great news for us. Um, this confirms what we know from the oxygen, strontium, neodymium, whole rock database from previous studies in the Stokes Mountain region. And it also kind of confirms what we suspected based on the magnesium number, which I haven't talked about yet. Um, so magnesium number is the, sort of a good way to, to gauge the amount of differ differentiation that's happened. Um, a depleted mantle-derived basaltic magma should have magnesium numbers between 72 and as low as 65. Um, and so you can see we have a few values that are high enough to be considered uh, d derived straight from the mantle. Um, but some of our lower values would indicate to us that we have some sort of differentiation happening here. Um, and so all three of these, uh, all three of these uh, sort of proxies, our magnesium number, our older whole rock isotopic data, and um, our new epsilon hafnium um, delta 18 values all suggest that this um, assimilation, fractional crystallization trend, is um, influencing depleted mantle-derived melts, right? Okay, so that's conclusion number one. So uh, essentially, because we were able to confirm that the Stokes Mountain region was derived from depleted mantle, um, we can confirm that our first hypothesis is true, that this technique of using the paired isotopes in gabbroic zircon is successful. So, which is great news, because I would like to do the rest of my project. Um, and so we're going to use now uh, the same technique um, in the Eastern Sierra. So I've highlighted here for you um, the values of the gabbros from the East, um, and I've placed their magnesium numbers here. So first off, we have lower magnesium numbers than one would expect from a mantle-derived basaltic magma. Um, and we also don't see any trend. Um, in any of, uh, the Stoke, any of the eastern um, uh, magmas. And so what this indicates to us is that these magmas um, have a more complex origin of just de uh, derivation from the mantle and then some sort of differentiation process. Um, and so it's up to us to sort of figure out what's happened um, to the composition of this, of this magma. So we've come up with three potential um, interpretations. Uh, interpretation number one. Um, is that these rocks are derived from depleted mantle and that coupled AFC processes um, have changed their isotopic composition. Number two is that uh, the parental magmas of these eastern uh, gabbros were derived from an enriched mantle source. Um, and number three is that these magmas were um, the product of a remelted uh, mafic body that was hydrothermally altered and then thrust into the magma source region um, in the Eastern Sierra. All three of these hypotheses have been um, put out there and tested by petrologists in the past. Um, so these, we feel safe um, trying to go through and do um, a data-driven analysis of each one of these uh, interpretations. So we're gonna start with interpretation number one. So I've left the Western um, values here as sort of um, an analogy, right? We understand that this is what an AFC trend of a depleted mantle should look like, right? Um, so number one, um, if these rocks were depleted mantle derived and then they were influenced by AFC processes, the first thing that would have to happen, we'd have to start with a magma that had a composition up here and we'd have to 
uh, mix it with an assimilant that had such a negative epsilon half mu value that we now have the composition of our parental magma down here. All of this happening without changing the delta O18 value very much. And if it gets changed at all, if anything, it gets pushed lighter, right? Um, so we can come up with maybe one potential um, uh, assimilant that would have these negative values. Um, so crustal rocks, specifically sediments that were originally extracted from the, uh, the mantle like a really long time ago, more than two and a half billion years ago, would potentially have this negative epsilon half mu value. But rocks that have been at the surface should have delta O18 values that plot over here, maybe even farther. Um, and we don't see any indication of uh, heavy um, delta O18 values in this case. Um, so we uh, dismiss this possibility as uh, possible but improbable based on um, the unlikely uh, composition of such an assimilant. Um, interpretation number two is that these magmas are derived from an enriched mantle source. Um, the composition of the mantle with regard to delta O18 is fairly consistent. This is a mass balance thing. Um, and so these mantle-like oxygen values for us are very convenient because it ties our negative epsilon half mu values to the mantle instead of to an assimilant. Um, and the negative epsilon half mu values sort of preclude derivation from a depleted mantle melt, um, which would be way up here. Additionally, the Kern Plateau, which is located right here, geographically um, is in line with the other provinces that have... Uh, been suggested to have been derived from an enriched mantle melt. And then there is this really nice isotopic congruency. Um, so one of the more traditional isotopes to use to look at the mantle is neodymium or epsilon neodymium. Um, and there is a rough estimate. Um, epsilon half mu equals roughly two times the values of epsilon neodymium. Um, and the, uh, the established epsilon neodymium for the Lamarck granodiorite, which is here, and the Onion Valley and uh, metamorphic, no, that's wrong, the Onion Valley Mafic complex uh, are 4.5 and 4.3 respectively. So double that is give or take negative nine, um, which fits nicely right here in our, in our sort of shotgun pattern of um, epsilon half mu values. Um, so we, we like this interpretation. Um, interpretation number three um, suggests that perhaps um, these magmas were uh, the product of remelting of a mafic body um, that had been previously hydrothermally altered at low temperatures, which would give um, that body a low delta O18 value, and then got thrust into the magma source region that these rocks were derived from. So this has been um, proposed by a few other researchers um, in the past. It's a difficult um, hypothesis to test, um, but evidence for this um, are these lighter oxygen isotopes um, that are over here. So if we're going to, oops, if we're gonna go with convention that says that delta O18 is consistent in all mantle source regions, we need to somehow account for these lighter isotopic values. Um, they, it could also be a result of say like a fluid, a low delta O18 fluid, metasomatism. Um, uh, yeah. Um, and this hypothesis of this remelting of a mafic body would also account for our moderately low magnesium numbers. One difficulty with this um, interpretation, however, is that because we're dealing with these gabbros with essentially basaltic magma, um, this initial body, uh, mafic body, has got to be mafic enough, that's an odd phrase, such that you can still extract um, a basaltic magma. Um, and so coming up with a lithology um, that uh, sort of fits that bill is difficult. I don't think it's impossible, um, but it certainly limits um, the, the possible um, bodies that could be thrust under. Um, and I don't have a slide for it, but I should certainly say um, that there is sort of a hybrid interpretation um, that number one, we are focused um, here with enriched mantle derived magmas that are assimilating um, a, a, a mafic body that's been under thrust. Um, the isotopic values for both of these interpretations are, are seen in, um, in, in, in the data. And so it's hard to select one versus the other. Um, based on that, we have some continuing work that's, uh, that's happening. Um, I'm doing some work at UCLA over the summer 
Um, and I have big plans for this Tim's that's at UT Austin. Um, the first thing uh, that we need to do is look at the strontium and neodymium isotopes, go back to whole rock um, uh, of both the granites and the gabbros, mainly because this will allow us to tie our rocks um, to the other bodies in the east that have been proposed to come from this eastern uh, enriched mantle province. Um, and then there are a few other um, stable isotopic system, so delta D, which is a hydrogen isotope, and delta Cl37, which is chlorine, um, are really good at looking at the composition of fluids. Um, and that can tell us whether there was metasomatism, or maybe it can help us um, identify the kind of alteration um, of a potential body that's been thrust under. Um, the strength of this is that we can sort of get at the nature of that enrichment should it exist. Um, and recently, we looked at the epsilon hackneum values of zircon from the Kern Plateau uh, associated granitoids, and they're really negative, which is beautiful for us. Um, and I'll be playing with the delta 18 of uh, those over the summer at UCLA. Um, but the composition of the granitoids is really important for us to sort of uh, decide which interpretation um, is correct in the East. Um, so my conclusions, um, we've already talked about conclusion number one and about the Western Sierra. Uh, we can confirm using this relatively new technique of paired oxygen and half new isotopes in mafic zircon uh, that the Western um, magmas are derived from a depleted mantle melt. Um, and we can use the same um, technique in the Eastern Sierra where we see distinct isotopic signatures. They're very different from those in the West. Um, we favor an interpretation of derivation from an enriched mantle source coupled with the assimilation of an underthrust altered body, mafic body. Um, and those are essentially the, yeah, there we go. Um, beautiful. I have a few acknowledgments. Um, I've got funding from a lot of sources. Um, the peer, I, we have, our travel was accounted for by a PRF grant. The Northern California Geological Society gave me a huge chunk of money. Um, I have a grant made of research from Sigma Xi. I have research money from uh, the Sally Casanova Predoc Predoctoral Scholars Program in the Chancellor's Office, and then additional funds from both the College of Natural Science and Math and from the Geology Department. And I'd like to thank my committee members, and um, I'd like to ask if there are any questions.